Grace, mercy, and peace are yours according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, picture this. The time is running out. You don't know how many days you have left, but you know that the time is short. The end is near. But for the moment, you have a pretty good amount of time on your hand because of the time that you do have, you're mostly spending alone in the same room all day. Most of your loved ones have either gone on ahead of you already or they're busy with the rigors and the vigors of life. So with this time that you've got, you sit down and you decide to write something. You decide to write a letter to the ones you love most so that they can have it after you're gone. And in this letter, you'll encourage them to hold on to the things that you treasured most in this life, the things you held most dearly. You can well imagine the tears that might stain a letter like that as you pour out your very heart and soul to the ones you love most. Today we have before us just such a letter. It's the last letter that we have in the, in the Bible from the Apostle Paul, written to his dear son in the faith, Timothy. Paul writes this letter from Rome, where he's been chained up and locked in prison for preaching about the name of Jesus. Paul writes this letter to Timothy, hoping that Timothy might be able to come and see him one last time, but he knows full well that Timothy might never get the chance. Paul knows that his time is short. He's got another trial to undergo, and after that, the end may well be near. So in this letter that Paul writes to Timothy, he pours out his very heart and soul and encourages him to hold on to what he held most dearly in this life. Paul, Paul encourages Timothy to hold on to the gospel, the gospel that he is not ashamed of, the gospel that he is not ashamed to proudly claim and to boldly proclaim. This is the one thing that Paul just had to pass on to Timothy one more time. And so he addresses this letter to Timothy, my dear son. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience. As night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Paul and Timothy had been through thick and thin together, traveling around the world from church to church, spreading the gospel together. And if Paul needed one person to go on an important mission, Timothy was his right-hand man. So the last time that they had parted, it was an emotional goodbye. There was tears as they pulled themselves apart from each other. And now Paul longs to see his dear protege, his dear son in the faith one more time. He goes on, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Paul had first met Timothy way back on a second missionary journey as he was traveling through the city of Lystra, preaching. And we're told in the Bible that Timothy's father was a Greek, and that meant he was probably also an unbeliever. But Paul remembers Timothy's mother and his grandmother, who were devout and God-fearing believers. And these women raised Timothy up in the knowledge of the scriptures, so that from infancy, Timothy had known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. What an amazing gift and blessing that Timothy had received from his mother and his grandmother. Maybe it's because this letter is written to Timothy 
and my name is Timothy. And Paul brings up Timothy's mother and grandmother, but I cannot help of thinking my own mother and grandmother. Last year they went to heaven. Mom first, after a four-year battle with cancer at age 58. Then five months later, Grandma, after 90 strong years, together with my father and my grandfather, they raised me up to know the gospel, to know the thing that was most important to them, to know the message of Jesus. From infancy, they raised me to know the Holy Scriptures. That is a gift that is the most important thing parents can pass on to their children. So that's a gift that will last far after you are gone. That's a gift that lasts to eternity. So no matter how hard it is to struggle sitting through church with squirrely children or to remember to read Bible stories before you go to bed or to pay expensive tuition, it will all be worth it because this gift of the gospel that you can give to your children will last far after you're gone. Paul recognizes the gift that had been given to Timothy by his mother and his grandmother, and now he encourages them. Now he encourages Timothy. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. It was just a few months ago that I knelt right here as we had the same custom as a number of pastors gathered to lay their hands on me and encourage me and give me a special blessing as I entered the ministry. This is the custom that Paul is talking about here. So he encourages Timothy to grow in the grace and the gift of God that he had received. He encourages him to grow in the ministry, to fan into flame what he had received. If you think about a fire bellows, you open that thing wide and you suck in as much air and then you blow it through the bottom of the fire so that the flames blaze up. This is the picture that Paul wants to use with Timothy. We open wide God's word. We suck in as much of God's word as we possibly can and we blow it through the fire of our faith so that it blazes so that the Holy Spirit makes our gifts grow. Paul encourages Timothy to fan into flame the gift of God, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity. Now, do you think Timothy might have had a reason to be timid? Here, his mentor, his father in the faith, Paul, was locked in prison in Rome, probably awaiting his death. And Paul's encouraging Timothy to keep on preaching the same message that could get him locked in prison and sentenced to death. Do you think Timothy had a reason to be timid? Here, this crazy Emperor Nero guy was rounding up Christians and putting them to death in all kinds of awful ways. Timothy had a reason to be timid. It certainly would have made me think twice about speaking this name of Jesus too loudly. Over the years, I've come to love having the name Timothy. So it reminds me of everything that Paul encourages his dear son in the faith. Timothy is such a cool name. It's a Greek name, which means honoring God. And how I wish that that was the perfect description of my life. But as I think back about my life, that other word is a much better description. Timidity. That's what Tim is really short for in my life. Timid, fearful, afraid, ashamed, silent. Have you had moments like that? Someone asks you about what you believe or why you believe it. You get all tongue-tied and twisted, unable to answer, anxious and afraid. 
when the topic of religion even gets brought up because you might have to say something. That fear naturally fills our hearts, makes us fearful and fretting that somebody might think that we're brainwashed with all this stuff or that we're pushy and we're trying to push it on them or that they might just call us a fool, slam the door in our face. That's the fear that naturally fills our heart as we're ashamed sometimes to even claim Jesus. If you felt like that, you are not alone. I've had tons of moments like that. Even Peter, one of the Lord's closest disciples, he seemed to have a hard time claiming Jesus that night, the night before Jesus was crucified, that night when Peter's life could have also been on the line. Do you remember what Peter said when the girl asked him, hey, weren't you one of those guys with Jesus? No, no, I swear I don't even know the man, Peter said. That's the fear that naturally fills our heart and shuts our mouths makes us ashamed to claim the name of Jesus. Paul encourages Timothy, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord Jesus Christ. This verse came to life for me last week as we, Mount Olive, had a booth down at Oktoberfest. We were there passing out balloons and Bibles and devotion books and invites to come to worship and invites to come to fall festival and all kinds of things. And as people would walk by, as you could guess, the balloons were the biggest hit. Man, the children would see me. They'd run up. Some of the, sometimes they were even crying because it was a cold day. And I'd give them a balloon, and they'd go away smiling I felt like the most popular person on earth. We could have given away thousands of balloons if we had enough helium. But then we ran out of helium. And the moment of crisis hit me about halfway through the afternoon when we had no more balloons to give away, and this thought hit me. Now what are we going to do we can't give away any more balloons, and all we have left is this stack of Bibles. You see how silly that is? Why did I feel like the most popular man on earth with a full stack of balloons? But when I had a full stack of Bibles, I felt like a traveling phone book salesman in a world that's gone to Google. Do you see how silly that is? What is more valuable? A five-cent rubber balloon that could literally blow away in five seconds on a windy September day, or the testimony about Jesus, the words of everlasting life, the book that can give you the knowledge of salvation. So why is it so much easier for us to give out balloons than it is for us to share the message of Jesus? That fear fills our hearts. It makes us timid. And when it makes us ashamed to claim it, then it also makes us afraid to proclaim it. And what we end up doing is taking our star player, the eternal gospel, and putting it on the bench while we muddle around like some third-string quarterback. And then the temptation that comes next is so much more glaring. Then we try and find ways that we can be more proud of our gospel, that we can make it easier to share. So this is what we do. We take it, and this is the temptation. I'll just change a few things here or there. That Old Testament stuff about fasting, that's not really relevant anymore. We can forget about that. Uh, and these lines over here, 
They're a little too stringent about what I can and can't do. I don't really like that. So let's get rid of that. Oh, but this section right here about don't judge others. Don't judge others. I like that one. Let's keep that one. I can be proud of that one. That's the temptation we face. That's the temptation that Paul encourages Timothy so adamantly to stay away from. Do not change this gospel. So what is it that overcomes our lockjaw? What is it that makes us, that makes the difference between us being ashamed of Jesus and us being confident about claiming him and about proclaiming him? Only the gospel can make that difference. And so we open it and read it once again, and we see what our God has done for us. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. Before the world even began, God put into motion a plan to save you. He called you from eternity, and then he put a plan into place to make sure that you would be his own forever. And so he sent his son to be born into the battlefield that is this earth. And he sent his son to take on sin, death, and the devil in a one-on-three match, a fight to the death. So Jesus was born. And he sent sin packing because he never once fell in this sin. And then he fought to the death, even to death on a cross. And death thought it had won. Death thought it had claimed the victory as there Jesus lay in the grave. But Jesus got out of that grave on the third day. He broke death's prison forever, and he delivered the blow to the devil's head that would crush his head forever, just as God had promised. Our Savior, Christ Jesus, has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. By rising from the dead, he destroyed death. And he has given you this gospel. This is your gospel. This is my gospel. This is a message that was written down by eyewitnesses of this gospel. Men who had seen the risen Lord Jesus, who had felt the holes in his hand. This message was written down by men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down the very words that they wrote. And this message was written by men who were willing to die to hold on to it. This is your gospel. This is my gospel. This is our 3,000 carat, world's largest diamond ever. This is the gospel diamond of our faith. If you take this diamond this gospel diamond and put it on a woman's finger you think she's going to be afraid to claim it's hers you think she'll be afraid to show that diamond off to everybody that she knows now think about this you are the bride of Christ and God has put this diamond in your hands on your finger Christ has called you to be his own from eternity and then he went to hell and back to make sure that that would happen. This is the most glorious message ever. What could we possibly be ashamed of? This is the message that saves us. This is the message that takes away our sin. I am not ashamed because I know what has saved me. I am not ashamed to proclaim it, 
because I know what it's done for me and I know what it can do for each and every person that I meet. I am not ashamed, Paul says. Will you read this with me? I am not ashamed because I know him whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Our Savior has entrusted us with this gospel message and we entrust to him everything that we are, our life and all that we do. We entrust to him everything. All of our eggs are in his basket for the last day and we know they'll be safe. And now what do we do in the meantime while we wait? Paul encourages Timothy, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. For God does not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. And so that spirit by, God, by God's power makes us able to declare this is my gospel I am not ashamed to proudly claim it and to boldly proclaim it because in this gospel I have life and because in this gospel you can have life too and everyone that you know this gospel is so beautiful all on its own it doesn't need any rewrites this is a gospel love letter written to you by your Lord Jesus Christ. Hold on to it just as it is. And so Paul encourages Timothy one last thing. Keep the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Guard that gospel diamond like your life depends on it because it does. Guard it with everything that you have with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. But don't be afraid to show it off in all its beauty to everyone that you know. Don't be afraid to claim it and proclaim it. This is the gospel that gives life. This is my gospel. I am not ashamed. Amen. Please stand. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. This is your gospel. This is my gospel. Amen.